Okay, uh, so thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about organic photovoltaics. Um, this is going to be mostly an overview of the field with a lot of focus on the uh, state of the art in the field right now. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the global energy demand is predicted to increase by 56% in the coming decades by the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And in that increase, it's predicted 2.5% annually, uh, an increase in renewable energy usage. And so as we move forward, we want to make sure that photovoltaics are a large part of that 2.5%. Uh, one of the ways to do that is to invest in uh, dynamic, adjustable, uh, adaptable energy technologies. And one of those more adaptable technologies is organic photovoltaics. Um, they have quite a few advantages in that they're uh, very cheap to produce. They have low energy fabrication costs because of their roll-to-roll -roll printing and solution processability. Um, they have a high degree of flexibility, which increases the number of applications they can be used for. They have very thin active layers, so that also drives down the costs. And they have tunable optical and electronic properties, um, which allow them to be tailored to specific applications. Um, but you know, with any with any uh, with any photovoltaic, there's always going to be challenges. Um, with organic photovoltaics, uh, traditionally the device lifetimes have not been long enough to make them uh, significantly industrially viable at the current costs, and uh, the efficiencies have been less than their inorganic counterparts up to date. Um, also, there are also problems with their morphological properties, being that you know it is traditionally a bulk hetero junction, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and those are relatively difficult to predict or to control the morphology of those devices. So one of these technologies that OPVs uh, is really interesting uh, in terms of its application are solar windows. Um, the state of the art right now is to use uh, silicon-based uh, solar window technology, but as you can see from the image uh, in the top left, the, the silicon windows are opaque and not very transparent at all. Uh, this results in shadows inside of the buildings. And so you have to use modeling and, and uh, other techniques in order to maximize the uh, natural lighting present inside of a building when you're trying to take advantage of this type of uh, material. They're also considered to be relatively expensive with the cost of silicon wafers and uh, <clears throat> Um, and they're financially and energetically expensive to produce. So uh, an alternative to that would be uh, OPV technology. And this is something that's actively being explored by the Next Energy Company, uh, which uh, the strauss platana group has been working with. And so you can see here, uh, OPVs are uniquely suited to work for an application like this because with their optical and electronic tunable properties, um, you can adjust the UV and the near IR uh, band gaps for these different uh, active layer materials so that they don't absorb in the visible spectrum, thereby uh, allowing them to be visibly transparent. And as it is uh, for fullerene acceptors, they're highly absorbing in the near IR without much alteration from uh, their uh, normal process. And so uh, with very thin active layers, as I said before, uh, less than 100 nanometers, um, they're already fairly transparent. So this is a, a particular application where you can see that the, the tunability and flexibility of OPV technology can really thrive. Um, however, traditionally the efficiencies of devices of these types of devices have only been about 5%. Um, there are some outliers where you get some devices that are as high as 7, but uh, the majority of those devices uh, with good transparency are only about 5%. So you can keep that in mind when we get towards the end of the presentation and I'll show you some figures from Next Energy. So uh, another thing that's really nice about organic photovoltaics is again the processability. So spin coating and blade coating those are traditionally more lab scale techniques. Um, they allow for a large degree of uh, control over the morphology especially with blade coating um, you can control the thickness of that film and then make sure it's regular throughout the process that you're making it. Um, 
but there are also uh, larger scale scalable techniques as well including inkjet printing and vapor deposition uh, inkjet printing it's been shown you can uh, make quite complex devices with many different active layers and uh, hole blocking layers electron blocking layers with uh, reasonable reproducibility um, there's also uh, been quite a bit of, an, of work done on vapor deposition method uh, to produce these OPV devices and specifically Heliotech has pioneered a lot of that uh, technology uh, focusing on OPVs. So here we can look at the efficiencies over time for organic photovoltaics. Uh, you may notice this is the bottom right uh, of the uh, NREL chart that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Um, this is uh, the region for the emerging photovoltaics and this is right where you'll find organic photovoltaics. So you can see that you know with the first OPV donor acceptor device built in 1986 with a 1% PCE, we've come a long way uh, since since the 80s, uh, with current efficiencies getting up to 11% uh, for single heterojunction devices, and then Heliotech this year uh, reporting a 13.2% device that's a tandem cell, and they achieved that uh, high efficiency by stacking uh, three different types of absorbers so that was a green a red and a near infrared light uh, absorber layer and the reason they were able to do that is because organic photovoltaics lend themselves to um, uh, optimizing different regions of their absorption in in the visible spectrum uh, and that that again comes to the uh, the flexibility and the adaptability for this technology so before we go further, uh, the rest of the talk is going to be geared more towards the more chemistry side. And so I wanted to take a minute to go over some of the fundamentals that uh, are present in OPVs. Uh, for example, one of the big ones that's uh, uniquely different from photovoltaic technology is uh, we tend to think of these as uh, individual donor acceptor molecules. And so they would have a distinct HOMO and LUMO, meaning a highest occupied molecular orbital and a lowest unoccupied molecular orbital respectively. So uh, just a quick run through, light comes in, we excite an electron, and then it delocalizes to the acceptor, and the hole that's left behind in the HOMO is from the donor is delocalized to the anode. And the way this works is we use a, a driving force to uh, uh, introduce an energy favorability for that electron to hop from the donor to the acceptor. And so these variables, uh, I have them listed here, the driving force and the VOC, uh, these are pretty easily uh, adjusted in OPV systems by chemically altering the donor or the acceptor. Um, the VOC being the open circuit voltage, you can obviously add electron withdrawing groups to the acceptor and therefore decrease that LUMO energy and increase the driving force, but May perhaps subsequently decreasing the VOC. Um, and so these are just some of the optimization uh, variables that we are have available to us in the OPV community in order to get those higher efficiency devices and to optimize a given donor acceptor pair. Um, our lab specifically is focused a lot on designing new acceptors. Um, for OPV technology. That way, you know, there's an acceptor that's going to energetically uh, work well with any, with a given donor, uh, and the larger the library of the acceptor, the easier it is to make a good pair between the acceptor and the donor in terms of those energetics. Um, so we do also care a lot more about recombination in OPV devices. Um, that's predominantly because the number of charge carriers at any one time in an OPV device versus a traditional photovoltaic is much lower. So uh, you know the first and most obvious recombination is. Uh, straightforward recombination of the exciton to the whole pair um, if it does not delocalize to the or hop to the uh, acceptor LUMO. But then let's say if it makes it to the acceptor, uh, then there's obviously the second recombination, is geminate recombination, where the now delocalized exciton manages to find a hole and recombine. Um, and then lastly, there is the dreaded trap state. Um, these trap states are inherent in both photovoltaics and OPVs, but uh, in OPVs the trap states can come through a lot of different um, 
chemically uh, chemical degradation processes that can take place in the device. <clears throat> so uh, moving forward, I want to spend some time talking about morphology and the basic device structure that we use in OPVs. So there's traditionally considered two different types of uh, device structures. That's the bilayer or planar structure and the bulk heterojunction structure. So the bilayer structure is relatively straightforward. It's just a donor and then an acceptor stacked on top or vice versa, um, depending on the type of architecture you're using. Uh, however, it's thought that the uh, charge separation actually occurs at the amorphous interface between that donor and acceptor. And so you can imagine that the uh, surface area of the donor acceptor interface is going to be smaller in a planar, in a planar structure or a bilayer structure. So a bulk heterojunction structure maximizes the amount of amorphous uh, donor acceptor interface, but simultaneously you can't just have all amorphous interface, because if you do, then there's no way to conduct the charges back out of the device. You just have recombination. So the key here is to try and optimize the uh, amount of amorphous region to uh, crystalline region in your bulk heterojunction so that you can get the maximum number of charges delocalized to those electrodes. And so you can see in these efficiencies here uh, that, that difference between the bilayer and the bulk heterojunction. Most bilayer devices really only reach efficiencies of about a tenth of a percent or 0.1%. And then bulk heterojunctions have reported efficiencies as high as 11 percent. Um, <coughs> right. So if we stick with the bulk heterojunction, there's a few different versions of that that have been developed over time. So we have the standard bulk heterojunction. That's going to look a lot like a traditional photovoltaic. And then you have the inverted bulk heterojunction. That's actually where the uh, anode and cathode have been switched so that you flipped the device. Uh, hence the name inverted. Uh, that's predominantly because uh, having a low work function uh, cathode, which ends up being very reducing, uh, has shown to cause has been shown to cause several different degradation pathways that are present in the device. Um, this can be due to water or oxygen, uh, or just the acidity of a lot of these um, common work uh, low work function cathodes. So by flipping this, you can avoid that because you can use a higher work function cathode at that point, and uh, you can use something like molybdenum oxide or zinc oxide and replace the more uh, corrosive uh, uh, cathode materials that have been used traditionally in standard bulk heterojunctions. And so using that technology, you can move forward to the more complex tandem bulk heterojunction. Um, as I said before, OPVs... Uh, lend themselves well to uh, being designed for tandem cells. Uh, you can have, this is the most simple version that you can have uh, displayed on the far right. And that's just with two uh, different band gap materials, two different active layers, one for the larger band gap and one for the smaller. And those are connected by an interconnecting layer. This is usually something like titanium oxide. It's just a medium to prevent the uh, small band gap and the large band gap uh, mixing with each other and uh, making a more complex morphology where the electrons are able to reach a lower energy state um, before they're delocalized so you can maximize the amount of VOC that you can get out of the device and uh, still delocalize electrons using that titanium oxide. And so it's been predicted that these tandem devices can reach uh, efficiencies up to 30%. And so uh, this is an exciting area to continue working in, in terms of these tandem devices. And Heliotech, with their 13.2% efficiency reported uh, and predicting uh, up to 15% as their goal for the next coming years, uh, that's really optimistic for um, tandem OPV devices. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, that morphology keeps getting more and more complex the more and more layers you have to deal with, obviously. So... Here is a, a basic rundown of, of those morphology problems. This is just a couple of variables being changed, and you can see here how large the difference is in the morphology between different active layers, depending simply on the conditions in which those active layers were deposited. So in the top, uh, in the top uh, row of SEM images, you can see um, the ratios actually correlate to the donor fullerene ratio where the fullerene ratio is increasing, and that's true for the bottom layer as well. 
The top layer is a spin coated active layer that was deposited in toluene. And as you can see, as the concentration of fullerene increases, we're getting larger and larger aggregates. And these aggregates are going to be much larger than the optimal uh, size of the, um, of the grain size, which is commonly thought to be around 10 nanometers, since that's the exciton diffusion length. Um, and that's been shown pretty reliably experimentally. Um, then you can look at the uh, bottom uh, three SEM images. You can see the fullerene concentration is increasing a lot, but those were deposited in chlorobenzene, which uh, most fullerenes have a much higher solubility in than toluene. And so you can see the uh, grain size is visibly much smaller compared to what you get in the toluene deposited layer. And that's just for spin casting, which is really only a lab, a lab scale technique predominantly. Uh, and these are just a couple variables. Morphology gets much more complicated than that. I mean, you can talk about adding in additives um, like diiodooctane in order to decrease these aggregates. Um, you can also talk about annealing the films to change the morphology. So there's a lot of variables that can be adjusted. And when you're optimizing these OPV devices, these are all variables that have to be considered. Um, but uh, moving forward, another problem or challenge, I should say, for OPVs is these uh, issues with degradation and lifetimes. So looking at this image, you can see there's quite a few ways that these devices can uh, degrade over time. You can have the aluminum intercalate into the polymer layer. You can form non-conducting aluminum oxides. Uh, you can have water poisoning the device. And so there's a large number of different potential decomposition pathways. Um, and so what we've tried to do in the strauss platalina group in conjunction with Next Energy is try and identify uh, some, of, some of the ways in which these devices are degrading. And so one of those aspects of this work is to focus on the uh, inherent impurities in the stock materials. So any uh, commercial chemical is going to have some number of Im some impurity present. Um, nothing is ever 100%. And so what we've been doing is trying to characterize and identify what these impurities in these stock materials are. And then once we've identified that they're present uh, or identified uh, what impurities they are, we can either then synthesize those impurities or we can design separation methods to remove the impurities from those stock materials. And then we can make devices and compare performance with and without that impurity so that we can decide whether or not these impurities are actually detrimental to device performance because obviously if an impurity does not negatively impact device performance, then there's no need to uh, make an effort to remove it or design uh, ways to minimize its effect on the device. And that would, of course, have a net uh, end result for improving device lifetimes based on, on the work that we're trying to do. Um, so I'm just going to go over briefly uh, the sort of methodology that I just outlined in a real example that we used in our lab. Um, so this was a vendor sample from PCB, uh, from Next Energy of PCBM. And so you can see in the red boxes, uh, there was a 20 mole percent uh, impurity based on NMR. So NMR is really nice. It's allowing me to look at, if I know the rough structure of PCBM and the uh, chemical shifts in a given solvent mixture, I can correlate that to these other chemical shifts here. And I can see that obviously there was some... Uh, PCBM-like impurity, that's what I've been calling it, uh, present in the crude material sent from us, sent to us by Next. And so I decided to try and come up with a separation scheme, and you can see that I found something that worked reasonably well, uh, and that's 60-40 toluene heptane by uh, HPLC separation using the Bucky Prep uh, stationary phase, which is a pyrene stationary phase con uh, bound to silica. And you can see that I was able to separate the bulk of the PCBM from this impurity. And then by analyzing uh, the UV-Vis data as well as those chemical shifts, I determined that the impurity was actually this 5,6 isomer. Um, PCBM is uh, a 6,6 uh, 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 PCBM molecule, meaning it is bound over a double hexagon junction. And you can see in the differences from the right to the left, the 5,6 isomer is over a hexagon and a pentagon. The 5,6 isomer is a common starting material to make PCBM. 
And so it's much more reactive than PCBM. And so it makes sense that devices made with this impurity would not perform as well over time because the amount of PCBM uh, available in, in the material would change with time. And obviously, uh, based on data sent to us by Next, uh, it had deleterious effects on the device performance. So this is just a, a good example of exactly what it is we're trying to do uh, in this work with Next, at least related to removing impurities. We're also looking into uh, studying what uh, degradation products form over time in uh, devices that don't have detectable impurities. And so that's an active area of work uh, that I'm, that's going on right now between us and Next Energy. Um, but using these, uh, using these uh, methodologies in their own work, Next Energy has been able to report uh, some very exciting data. Um, uh, they're reporting up to 50% transparency for their window devices, uh, 30 plus years lifetime, which is, to my knowledge, unprecedented in the uh, organic photovoltaic industry. Um, I've tried and have not uh, succeeded in finding any other device uh, devices that are reporting uh, lifetimes as long as that. Uh, also, they're reporting approximately 10% efficiencies, which is well within the industry viable uh, efficiencies for OPVs due to the lower costs, and uh, a one-year simple payback, meaning uh, the cost of the device will pay itself back in the energy that you produce in one year, which is really promising for, for OPVs and for Next Energy. So we're very excited about that. Um, so with that, I want to go over uh, just briefly what we went over and then talk about uh, some future directions for OPV technology. So as I said, uh, greater than 13% efficiencies have been achieved by Heliotech, uh, and that was using a tandem device with vapor deposited um, active layers. And then uh, inverted device structures have been developed, and they've shown that they can avoid certain degradation pathways, which is good for improving lifetimes of these OPV devices. Um, and further advances on that front are being made all the time as we study and understand more of these degradation mechanisms that are present in these devices. Uh, and then, you know, very exciting, Next Energy Technologies has been able to report such, such astounding uh, data, such as 10% efficiencies, lifetimes 30, over 30 years, and uh, really short payback times, which is very exciting. Um, can't say that enough. <laughs> Uh, so future directions for OPVs are to continue expanding into the photovoltaic market, especially in uh, unique applications, so solar windows and other more flexible based uh, technologies as the efficiencies and the lifetimes continue to improve. Um, work still needs to be done on improving the device lifetimes, um, especially with targeting uh, degradation events that are occurring in devices that do not contain impurities and are forming over time. So that's that's an active area of research uh, between Next and the strauss boltalina lab and one that I'm excited to continue working on as we start narrowing down more of these uh, different degradation pathways. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the group for uh, helping me work on this research and specifically Steve and Olga, outlined in red, for their help on this presentation and of course the funding and uh, the Next Generation Photovoltaic Center and Next Energy Technologies. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Hello? Does it look like anyone had any questions? Uh, uh, but if you have any questions, um, Excellent job, Nick. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> okay, well, it doesn't sound like there. Well, it doesn't sound like there. Again, Nick, for taking the time to give your talk, mm -hmm. and uh, we look. And uh, we look hearing more in the future. All right. Future. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. All right.
Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, bye everyone. Thank you, everybody.